sure that the entire audience has good morning back. That's the quite, quite a, a, a wonderful reaction. Uh, welcome uh, to the UVM Alumni Association's 2021 George V. Kidder Award and Lecture Program. Thank you to everyone for joining us in person. We are in person today, which is fantastic. Um, as well as to those of you uh, tuning in from across the nation on our live feed. Um, we appreciate everyone making the effort to come on this beautiful Vermont morning. Sun may not be out, out there, but it is shining in here, right? It is shining inside. Uh, and of course, we're here to celebrate uh, our wonderfully accomplished and beloved faculty member, Pablo Bose. I'm Afi Amati, a proud alumnus of the class of 1993, and as president of the UVM Alumni Association, it is a special privilege for me to be a part of this annual event. Each year, the UVM Alumni Association bestows four signature awards, three of which celebrate outstanding members of our alumni community. The fourth, the Kidder Award, honors an exceptional, exceptional member of our faculty for excellence in teaching and for extraordinary contributions to the enrichment of campus life. Established in 1974, the award honors the memory of George V. Kidder, UVM class of 1922 and former dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Dean Kidder served the university for more than 70 years before his death in 1995. He touched the lives of thousands of students, including many living alumni for whom his insights and encouragement left a lasting impact on their lives. George Kidder's remarkable example gives this award its special meaning. We are thrilled to have the opportunity each year to recognize an incredible faculty member whose dedication inspires our students and keeps them engaged long after graduation. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce UVM's president, Suresh Garamel. Thank you, Afi, and I couldn't be happier that we're all here together in person. Really missed this last year. Um, we did one of these in my first year here. I don't know how many of you realize, but um, I think three quarters of my time at UVM has been COVID, and uh, I am very proud that UVM has among the best performance in the country, in the world, uh, with respect to COVID, because our students are such, that they're so dedicated to being here and, and, to, the, and to keeping the community safe, and our faculty have taught, um, you know, under somewhat trying circumstances. I think, Pablo, you taught in the Air Island Chapel, as I remember. Um, which, which I think accommodates like 700 people and you had 75 uh, distanced and all that. But, but we did the best we could and we had an in-person year, uh, even with all the, you know, distancing and gallons or tons or truckloads of uh, sanitizer and all that. But it just really is nice to be back. I missed this last year. I recorded a message for last year's winner, but for Cynthia Reyes two years ago, I know we had a lovely little lunch and a, and a nice ceremony, so it's uh, nice to be back. And I know a good number of our alumni and uh, friends have returned for this weekend and are enjoying some events here. I hope that next year um, it's, it's back to full capacity. Um, so congratulations, Afi, and to your team for, for all you're doing to keep folks safe, to... Uh, to give them a good experience. I know the deans have met with some of the alumni when they've come in and Patty and others. Uh, Jim Keller, thank you very much for your support. So, um, so again, I'm, I welcome all our guests here and I believe uh, it, uh, to, the, to the simulcast that's going on um, to convey my personal congratulations to uh, actually someone I've known almost from the very beginning when I came to UVM. I couldn't say this about all faculty at uh, UVM, but um, I met uh, Pablo at a very early dinner, um, some sort of a faculty conference where diversity issues had been discussed and he sat at my table and, um, and we had a somewhat fateful meeting. Soon after that, I asked him to come and, and we chatted and we've been, we've been friends, I would say, since then. Um, Pablo's always struck me as a, 
as a person really dedicated to his job, to his students, um, always thinking outside the box, always thinking about how to make things better. So Pablo, I'm, I'm really personally and truly thrilled that you are the one being recognized this time and because I, I, I know how um, deserved it is in your case. Um, to our audience members, um, any Kidder faculty who are here or watching, my colleagues, my academic colleagues and others, members of the Alumni Association leadership, uh, past winners and special guests, and of course, Dr. Pablo Bose, thank you all for being here today on this wonderful occasion. I know your parents are here. They're coming from Vancouver and they're very accomplished in their own right, so it's good to see them. I'm just so pleased to ha have this opportunity to celebrate a remarkable scholar, a teacher. Uh, you know, that word teacher scholar is used widely at UVM. We believe in it, but I think in Pablo's case, it's personified. It truly actually, he is a teacher scholar. I think if I didn't understand the word before, I understood it when I, when I see what you're doing. Um, you've been endorsed by uh, your, your students, your alumni, your peers. So um, Pablo Bos, for what, uh, for those of you who may not know, I think everyone knows him, is an associate professor in the Department of Geography, a Gund Fellow, a Fellow of our Gund Institute, and Director of the Global and Regional Studies Program in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, he began teaching at UVM 13 years ago, although it seems like a lifetime of contributions. Um, he received a BA in English from the University of British Columbia in 1995, an MA in Communications from Simon Fraser University in 2000, and a PhD in Environmental Studies from York University in 2006. He just ca cannot decide what he wants to be when he grows up. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out, and I've asked him to help me figure it out. Um, he's an outstanding and dedicated educator whose contributions extend far beyond the classroom, uh, and he's truly deserving of this award. Although it's clear that you've ignited a passion for learning and discovery in many of your students, and that you've inspired many of your colleagues, including me. The support the Alumni Association received in response to your nomination for this award was overwhelming. I want to take a few moments to share some of the sentiments expressed by Dr. Bose's students, faculty, peers, and alumni. One of your students said, it does not matter if the class has 100 students or 10. Dr. Bose engages everyone to think critically and crave further pursuit of understanding cultures and connections. I think if you can ignite in students a passion to go learn more, I, I think you've done your job and clearly you have. A colleague offered this observation, Dr. Bose embodies um, all that the award represents. He's an excellent classroom teacher. I'm reading because they're quotes. Engaging students with issues of diversity, globalization, displacement of refugees, and urbanization by using multiple pedagogy methods and creative assignments. You can tell a faculty member wrote that. Um, but it's, it's very complimentary, of course. And from an alumnus, uh, you can tell an alumnus wrote this. Dr. Bose works to build campus life beyond the classroom and establishes connections for his current students. So um, there are lots and lots and lots. I hope you've been given a packet of, your, uh, of the comments your nominees uh, provided because you can retire based on that. Don't retire, but it feels really good. Um, when reading the many letters to support for Dr. Paolo Vos, a few themes were reiterated time and time again. He's a gifted teacher, student-oriented, and committed for bettering our world. Seems so Vermont. It seems like everything UVM stands for. Dr. Bose, your students and colleagues have proclaimed it with conviction and deep affection. You're an exceptional mentor and educator. We're privileged that you've chosen to share your gifts with them and with us here at the University of Vermont. We congratulate you on this well-deserved recognition from your students, your former students, and your peers. And for all that you've done and all that you continue to do, we're deeply honored to recognize you as the winner of the 2021 Kidder Award. Not a big reveal, everybody knows this, but I gotta say it. So um, as a symbol of uh, our gratitude, allow me to present you with this um, Simon Pierce clock, it's heavy. As a daily reminder of your wonderful work on behalf of the University of Vermont, congratulations. Thank you, President Garamella. Um, at this time, uh, I'd like to play a special message from our 2020 
Kidder Award winner, Professor Todd Pritchard, to acknowledge this year's honoree, Pablo Bose. So, Professor Bose, if you could come up here with me, we're going to give you a tougher angle to watch. Thank you, Afi. Uh, Dr. Bose is a passionate and award-winning interdisciplinary professor whose research focuses primarily on issues of culture, space, and power. He is interested in diverse environments, refugee resettlement in non-traditional destinations, environmental displacement and, and advocacy, food and migration, transnationalism, and diasporas. A well-respected campus leader, Dr. Bose serves in a variety of roles in the department, college, and university levels. Dr. Bose is recognized by the community as a supportive mentor, advisor, and research supervisor who has a great impact upon his students and maintains relationships with them well beyond graduation. In addition to his pedagogical success, Dr. Bose is a nationally respected scholar and sought after speaker. He has presented his work and participated as a panelist both on campus as well as across the nation. On behalf of all of us who have received this distinguished honor, I congratulate you, Dr. Pablo Bose, on winning and receiving this year's George B. Kidder Alumni Award. I'd like to present you with your pin. May you wear it proudly. Okay, so traditionally, many of you know, uh, the pinning ceremony is done, as Professor Pritchard uh, acknowledged, from the prior award winner to the current award winner. Um, so an esteemed member of the faculty is pinning another esteemed member of the faculty. Um, I am a lecturer in the Grossman School of Business, so I cover member of the faculty. Uh, and so with your permission, if I may, and I think we want to do it on this side so that the folks at home can see me make you bleed. It requires the brain power of a Kidder winner to do that. Now I get why, why that requirement's in place. Um, in addition to uh, the Kidder clock uh, and the Kidder pin, please accept the Alumni Association's own token of our congratulations. And now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you the 2021 Kidder Award winner, Pablo Bose, to present his lecture, A New Home in the Green Mountains, Refugees, Resettlement, and Community-Based Geographic Research. Professor Bose. Thank you so much, uh, Afi and President Garamella, and all of you for, for coming, for all your, your kind remarks. Um, I've been asked to keep this within 20 minutes, which is always a, a challenge for any faculty member, but I will, I will endeavor to do so. I do not know if it's on. Is it? It's not. And also technology. Um, so I want to start really quickly just by uh, making some acknowledgments. Do I put it at this one? So I wanted to start by uh, just um, acknowledging some of the past awardees uh, and looking over the, the list of the previous uh, Kidder Award winners. I saw a number of people who've been really instrumental in my own um, success and adjustment to, to life here at UVM, Wolfgang Meter, um, Cynthia Reyes, uh, Tony Magistrale, um, Bob Tisbeer, who was actually my faculty mentor when I first uh, came here, number of different people that I saw who have, uh, Bob Taylor, uh, a number of others who've been really uh, central to my own stay here at UVM. I also wanted to acknowledge Glenn Elder, who's the reason that I 
came to UVM, um, before I came to Vermont, I am not 100% sure I knew where Vermont was, um, but I think I had, I, I had watched Newhart in the 80s. Um, but Glenn Elder, who was the chair of the geography department and then later associate dean um, in the College of Arts and Sciences before his untimely uh, death in 2009, um, he recruited me from, um, from my PhD program for a, uh, a, a postdoctoral program here at UVM called the Henderson Fellowship. And I came in through that program, which is uh, meant to recruit faculty of color um, to UVM. And so Glenn was really instrumental in that. I also want to acknowledge um, a number of my colleagues, both inside and outside the Department of Geography, um, especially Megan Cope, uh, who was really my mentor, not only in the geography department, but within geography. As you heard from President Garamella, I've had an eclectic journey around the disciplines, and geography was, was new to me. Um, and so Megan has really been uh, absolutely central in, my, um, in finding a home in geography, finding my own home in the Green Mountains. Uh, Sherry Morse. One of my colleagues in geography has done the most to uh, actually acquaint me with um, uh, Vermont and, and what Vermont is, not to fear uh, the rural as somebody who's an urban geographer. Uh, and also my colleague uh, and co-director of global studies, uh, Jonah Steinberg in anthropology, um, has really helped me find new research and teaching directions here at UVM. Uh, and finally, the students and the communities that I have uh, had the opportunity to work with here in Vermont, but beyond Vermont as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those opportunities with students. Um, so I am a migration scholar and an urban geographer, and that is really the way in which um, both my research and teaching before I came to UVM had been oriented. Uh, I was very much inclined to study large cities, uh, immigrant populations within large cities, displacements in other parts of the world. My work hadn't been all that focused on, um, on North America. Uh, where I did study North America, I had primarily been looking at um, cities like New York and Toronto and Vancouver, large cities, looking at large immigrant neighborhoods within them, and overseas looking at population displacement um, because of things like dams. And I'd always done work that had been community uh, focused in some way or another. And so when I came to uh, Vermont and to UVM, it meant uh, a number of different kinds of transitions. First and foremost, I was coming from working in cities of 10, 12, 14, 16 million um, in, and living in a place like Toronto, which has 60% uh, foreign born population, and I moved to Burlington. Um, and I wasn't really sure where I was going to be able to do work either on immigration or migration or on large cities. And those were the two things that I was really kind of focused on. I was also not really sure what teaching would be like here because I had come out of institutions that, um, you know, as a graduate student, but also ones that prioritized graduate research in different kinds of ways. And I remember a piece of advice I'd gotten really early on um, maybe from Bob Tisbear, but from someone um, who is a mentor who said, don't lose the international focus in what it is that you want to do. You can still do international work here. And, you know, see if there are new directions in, in the, the bigger questions that you're interested in. And that's really what I discovered in, um, in doing my work here, that there were new ways for me to do work and new um, topics for me to explore. And so... Part of that process, especially in the first few years that I was here, was um, taking some time to really understand the landscape of a place like this, uh, learning the landscape of Vermont. And it was really teaching that in many ways grounded me in that ability to, to kind of become more familiar with this place. Um, there's a number of different courses that I've taught here at UVM, but I, I chose some of the main ones that are kind of in my rotation. Um, one of the things that's always been really central to me is that my teaching and my research are as connected as possible. That's also been a way for me to bring my students into my research um, through the classroom. And so the course that I teach the most often here is one of our big uh, race and racism in the U.S. courses. It's race and ethnicity in the U.S. 
I teach it both as a large lecture and in the summers I teach it as an online course. I teach a seminar on migration, mobility, and transnationalism. I teach a course on sports, which I really, really enjoy, um, kind of talking about all different facets of, of sports. Uh, I have a global cities class and I have a political ecology class which looks at um, environmental displacement. In all of these different classes, as I said, I really try and bring in the research that I'm doing outside of uh, the classroom in my own variety of different projects. So for example, I have a, a, a number of projects that look at the question of sustainability. Um, I'm doing some work on places like Bangladesh on the left and Mongolia uh, in the middle and looking at the effects of climate change and how they're affecting farmers, herders, a number of others. I have another project on the right there um, that looks at refugee camps, environmental sustainability, and um, public health crises. Um, I'm also doing a, a number of projects on food security and health, uh, the ways in which migration and belonging, identity, diaspora are all uh, connected. And all of these kinds of projects, as I said, are um, I use examples from them in those courses that I uh, I pointed to earlier. But the main example I want to focus on today is uh, this work that I have, uh, that's been central to my efforts over the last number of years, and that is on refugee resettlement. As I said, when I came here to Vermont, and I was looking for immigrants, and I was looking for cities, and I was having a more challenging time finding uh, both of them, what I noticed was here in Vermont, while there isn't as much of a history of um, large-scale immigration, I mean, there's certainly a, a longer history of uh, migration into the state, there isn't the kind of uh, patterns you'd find in Miami or in New York or you know, large cities like Chicago. But what you do see is this refugee program that's been around for 40 years. And so many of my efforts over the last decade have been to understand that pattern. Why is refugee resettlement happening in a place like Vermont? And one of the things I began to uh, discover is that this is something that is not just happening in Vermont, but is something that is happening in other parts of the US, in Canada, in Germany, in France, uh, in Nordic countries, in a number of different places. And so much of my efforts over the last number of years has been to, to look exactly at that. Now this is part of a bigger trend uh, when we look at this question of displacement. A decade ago, if you were to look at those who've been displaced by conflicts around the world or by persecution, um, it was just under 35 million people. Uh, by 2020, that number has grown to more than 80 million people. And again, this is only people who've been displaced by conflict, persecution, um, not those who've been, for the most place, displaced by natural disasters, environmental change, climate change, um, development projects, things like that. At the same time, while the trend towards having more refugees has grown, the reception of refugees has become much more contested. We have seen in many parts of the world a growing uh, xenophobic trend, uh, anti-immigrant trend, uh, a kind of politics of nativism, of populism, that has kind of coalesced around the question of refugees, including in the US. Um, but at the same time, there has been a, um, a simultaneous desire to do more, to do better, to adjust to the, the people who have been forced to flee. Take, for example, the Afghan resettlement that we see happening in the US right now. Um, there is, at the same time that there's concerns that are raised about this resettlement, there's a lot of interest in uh, in, in doing something with them. And this is something that I saw very much with my students early on. There are a great number of, of students everywhere, but especially here at UVM, who are really motivated to get involved in some kind of way, in different kinds of ways. I said before that one of the things that had been a challenge for me here was understanding how exactly to involve undergraduates in research. In the previous institutions I'd worked in, that wasn't as much of a thing. It is not to say that undergraduate students didn't do research, but I at least didn't know exactly how best to um, incorporate them into it. But through projects like this refugee resettlement project I've been working on for a number of years, I've kind of developed a new method, uh, for me at least, to, to incorporate them. And so what I've done is in those five classes I, I showed up front, 
In a number of them, they're actually introductory courses. And those introductory courses have been a fantastic way for me to, to recruit students. Uh, I find students who are particularly interested in these different kinds of topics. Uh, as I said, I bring in lots of examples from these. I encourage them to engage in, um, in getting to know these places by volunteering up front. And then after I get a chance to see their work, um, see how dependable they are, see the quality of their work, I then recruit them into my research teams in their usually second, third years. Often by their third year, they're gonna do an internship placement, uh, not a volunteer uh, opportunity, but a more focused, uh, often paid internship over the summer. Uh, things like the Simon Family, uh, Simon Family Foundation Public Research, it's a very long name, but it's awesome. The Simon family um, helps to, to pay for our students to take on these internship positions. They often explore uh, different aspects of resettlement through that. And then finally, many of these students also explore uh, topics like refugee resettlement through theses. So it has been wonderful. I always try and say I will never uh, advise more than two uh, honors theses a year. Often that ends up being eight to 10, but this year there's four, so I'm, try, I'm, I'm sticking uh, somewhat with it. But it's a wonderful opportunity for students to conceive of not just a portion of my research, but their own sort of spin on something, their own take on something, something that I haven't really explored as much. And this has had a really, really amazing kind of feedback loop for me. Not only have I had the opportunity to mentor and to train a number of students in research topics and methods, but it's also allowed me to gain immensely from the work that they're doing. Um, this new project that I'm doing, looking at rural resettlements and private sponsorship in Europe and, and uh, the US, in, in many ways comes out of work that a number of my students had done looking specifically at Canada, at uh, France, at, at Germany, and a number of others as well. So as I said, this has been uh, a kind of a, a central topic of, uh, of the work um, and really motivated by these three questions in particular. Why are refugees placed in smaller cities and towns, originally in the US, but increasingly looking at other places as well? What happens to them there and what happens to the places that receive them? The students, as part of this work, have done uh, a number of different kinds of research. They've done a lot of mapping work uh, we've cataloged places where refugees have settled to see new businesses that have been started, um, community centers that are used, um, places of worship, lots of other things like that. We've done these really interesting photo voice projects where we have given prompts to uh, some of the people who've been resettled, uh, things like what do you consider uh, a safe place, uh, a home, community, and ask them to take uh, images and talk about why they chose. This is down at Ethan Allen um, Homestead, uh, a rice paddy that was, uh, was uh, part of the, the New Americans farming program there. Uh, we've done a number of, uh, of polling public opinion work where we've looked at uh, through surveys, what is the opinion of refugee resettlement in a place like Vermont. And some of this work has really fed into efforts by the state who we have partnered with quite a bit to, for example, start a new refugee resettlement program in Brattleboro. Uh, one of the things that we actually found, one of our findings over a number of years was that many Vermonters wanted to see, were supportive of the refugee program, but they wanted to see it extend outside of Chittenden County. And so with a number of students right now, we're supporting the resettlement um, in Brattleboro and starting up again in Rutland. So when we look at why uh, some of these places have been uh, popular, um, this doesn't really cover the Northeast, but housing, uh, certainly in the Midwest and some other places, the cost of living. Economic opportunity has been one of the biggest drivers for um, refugees resettling outside of major metros. Um, and manageable size is one that came up as well. Um, as I said, we have a, a, a really huge number of these community-based projects that are ongoing. Um, one of the biggest tasks that my students and I have been engaged in is rebuilding the U.S. refugee program. Um, after four years of pretty draconian cuts, um, that is, uh, is a tall order, but it's something that um, 
and when I say my students, these are not just students that I'm working with now um, in, in my work at UVM, but as I'll show in a moment, a number of students who've worked with me in the past are doing really fascinating uh, elements of this in Wisconsin, North Carolina, Tennessee, um, as they've gone on either into, into jobs in the refugee resettlement sector or into graduate programs in other places. We're looking at community sponsorship models, um, looking especially at Europe and Canada and this new set of 30 spaces in, um, in the US that are being tested. Uh, we've had students do amazing projects on things like uh, if you're an employer and you want to hire a new American, what might be some best practices? So one of our former students, Isabel Dunkley, did a really interesting project where she uh, interviewed refugees and refugee employers. Um, she presented on this to the legislature, uh, created a toolkit that went to every um, chamber of commerce in Vermont uh, who might be interested in this. So stuff like that. Youth development programs that we've been doing with uh, the schools. Uh, and during the pandemic, uh, a number of our students um, sort of jumped into action in community-based projects looking at childcare, food insecurity, um, and healthcare and telemedicine. Um, I'm not gonna uh, just quickly show you here. This is just uh, a range of some of the different thesis projects that students have done in, in recent years connected to this research. Um, so as I said, it's been uh, really amazing to see the way in which the students have flourished during this process of, of kind of working with them over years, but also to see what they've done after they've left uh, UVM. This in many ways has been uh, tremendously, um, especially in times where I have felt uh, despairing at what is going on in you know, in the world in general, uh, to see some of what these students have achieved after they've left here, not only while they've been here, but how they've built on, on their education has been amazing. As filmmakers, Katie Jones down in that middle there was running um, a huge cross-country employment program at a re uh, resettlement agency. Haley Stern, um, as a city planner in Buffalo, has been working on refugee housing projects, um, filmmakers working on displacement projects um, all across the, the globe, um, working uh, in the Peace Corps and in diplomatic services, um, another planner, doctors, um, a number of teachers, uh, Sarah Galilee there works for the Clinton Health Initiative, um, tracking malarial vectors uh, in, um, in Southeast Asia. Um, Erin Kerr uh, up there was, uh, she worked for the Senate Judiciary uh, Committee as a nominations clerk. Um, Miraz Mustafa uh, down in the middle there worked for the International Center for Climate Change Research after he uh, graduated from UVM, um, went on to do a master's. Um, he and I are now writing a paper together. Uh, I've warned some of my students that they don't get away, once they get away from UVM, they don't escape my clutches. And so um, I'm doing a number of different projects with them. Uh, Brenna Foley and Tilden Remmerleach, uh, Annie Ryan, all of them went on to do National Geographic, Fulbright, Fulbright, um, and are doing really fascinating aspects of refugee research in different parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, Sami Ibrahim, who when she was at UVM was a triple major in global studies, geography, poli-sci, and minored in Russian. I honestly don't know how you'd have time to do all of those things. Um, she's doing her PhD in Wisconsin right now and is uh, somehow found the time to learn Dari and Pashto and so has been at Fort McCoy uh, helping to support Afghan refugees there. So it, it is really amazing to see what a number of these students go on to do. Uh, Tilden Remmerleach on the left there, National Geographic, um, uh, Young Explorers Award uh, winner, and she has gone on to do a pod, she did her senior thesis as a podcast on the lives of refugees in Vermont, um, and has gone on to do a podcast in Ecuador, uh, she's actually going to be working with me remotely on the Brattleboro uh, project as well. And the requisite picture of one of our uh, students, Meg uh, Polycastro, with 
uh, a usually chipper looking um, <laughs> Senator Sanders works in his office. She said that was the best picture she could get. Um, and uh, just a couple of quick shots here showing you uh, some of the students in action. Um, Emily Cloft, uh, Poli Sci 2019, um, could have walked out of here into any law school. I mean, just really a remarkable, remarkable student. Um, she was working with me with the youth development program. She ended up doing two years of AmeriCorps supporting employment in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, really pretty amazing. Um, here, we do a lot of kind of strange things. So in this, this is working with, um, my wife runs the refugee agriculture program down at the Intervale, and this was a contraption um, that they built to transport uh, refugee elders down to the farm. I do not believe it was ever used for that purpose because it looks a little, little dangerous. Um, but Isabel Dunkley, Sophie Clavel, uh, and my daughter um, testing it out. Uh, they were both, not my daughter, the other two were interns working with program. So some of our other um, students, geography, global studies, of course, needing to point to maps and globes uh, in our local schools. Um, and sometimes the work they do, it might be things like, um, this is Will Omohandro, who uh, ran a tutoring program for the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. They're our bigger, biggest partner, uh, work very closely with them. This fall, we have 25 uh, UVM students who are volunteering their time to work down there and sometimes it's just doing physics uh, homework and sometimes the work as Brenna down there is doing is it's just carrying hoses and cleaning up the farm. Uh, so amazing, amazing stuff that the students have uh, done through this work, um, through their enthusiasm, through their, uh, their skills and through just their, their energy. Um, and so I'll just uh, end there. I'll show one of, uh, I'll, I'll end with the last student I'll highlight here is Anitra Conover, um, global studies major, Chinese minor. She is working with me on this food bank project uh, in which she has put together food guides and toolkits to help uh, the food bank retailers and refugees themselves so that the food that they are receiving through food deliveries, um, food pantries, et cetera, is better, um, better aligns with their preferences and their desires. Uh, really amazing work writing a thesis on this topic as well. So I'll just uh, conclude by once again thanking my many colleagues, um, students, and friends who wrote letters of support, um, the George B. Kidder Outstanding Faculty Award Selection Committee, uh, the family of uh, Dean Kidder as well. Um, I had the opportunity to take a look after I, I was looking at the Kidder Award and there's a fantastic interview with him from the, I don't know, early 80s maybe? I can't remember. It's really, really interesting and it sort of talks about the ways in which he has seen the campus itself change. And it, was a, it was really interesting to sort of see that history of UVM. And finally, I wanted to thank the staff of the UVM uh, Foundation and especially Sarah and Andrea for all of their help um, just getting ready for this. So thank you all for coming on this rainy uh, Vermont uh, fall day and, uh, and I hope you have a great rest of your alumni weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Um, it's clear, I think, to everyone um, here today how your words and passion affect so many. I was really taken aback by the number of students that you impact and what they're doing. And I think that's a real mark of an incredible teacher, which is representative of the Kidder Award. For those of you who don't know, I'm Patty Prelock, Provost and Senior Vice President. And I'm so pleased to be able to share this amazing experience and this amazing talent here in the front row. Um, I've also known Pablo since he's been here, and, um, and I remember Glenn Elder, too. So that was one of his best hires, bringing you here. Um, and I miss him very much. Um, he left us too soon. So I think the good news is that you have inspired us and given us confidence that um, you can be, as a faculty member, an agent of change, as you saw that with the incredible number of students 
Well, I was actually, my breath was taken away when you were telling me all the things that um, your students were doing. I had heard these things, but um, pretty amazing, so you should feel, feel very proud. The Kittle Award is really a wonderful tradition that is sustained by the enthusiasm of the university community at all levels. And I hope this event has inspired you to reflect on the impact that our talented faculty um, and dedicated faculty members um, have had on your lives, our students' lives, and the lives of the community, and certainly in Pablo's case, the lives of the refugees. Um, to your parents, thank you for raising such an awesome son. Um, and sharing him with us. Um, uh, we don't want him to go anywhere. I have big plans for him um, beyond general education curriculum. Um, so just so you know, we are now ready to take nominations for the next Kidder Award winner. And I believe the forms are now online and we're taking nominations until December 10th of this year. So thank you so much for joining us on this glorious day. Thank you, Afi. Um, but we have a tent. And we'd love you to um, join us to just celebrate with Pablo, talk to him, and maybe ask him a few more questions about the incredible work that he does. So thank you to the UVM Foundation and the Alumni Association and Pablo. Thank you for being such an awesome faculty member. Thank you.